thank you all for joining us. I, I imagine we'll have a few people straggling on uh, as time goes on, but it's four o'clock, so let's get started. Thank you all for joining us. Um, Michael Eden is an Associate Professor of Medicine and Medical and Molecular Genetics at Indiana University. He got a BA at Northwestern University, he did an MD at Rush University, did his res uh, residency at Baylor College of Medicine, and had two fellowships, uh, he has two fellowships under his belt, both at University of Chicago. He's board certified in internal medicine, nephrology, and clinical pharmacology. He participates in NIDDK kidney precision medicine projects and other consortia. And his clinical interests are medica uh, medication dosing in renal failure and management of CKD, acute kidney injury, lupus nephritis, and glomerulonephritis. He's also on the consult service for clinical pharmacology pharmacogenomics, where, as I understand it, he provides consultation on genetic testing. Um, as many of you know, um, we encourage you to read his latest article in JCI Insight, Integration of Spatial and Single Cell Transcriptomics Localizes Epithelial Cell Immune Crosstalk in Kidney Injury. As I was saying earlier, the article has beautiful figures. It's very uh, comprehensive in methods, so those of you wanting to know more about it, I think you'll learn a lot from the methods. And the goal is to really um, use this kind of work to create tools to enhance diagnostic cap capabilities in a acute kidney injury. Um, I think I should also mention that in one of the reasons we selected Dr. Eden after talking with Kathy Mendelson and other leaders in Caribou is we really wanted to have somebody talk about epithelial tissue and especially somebody who's doing uh, using cutting edge technology. And uh, really Dr. Eden's work fit that bill quite nicely. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Eden, thank him for his time in meeting with us 15 minutes early and we'll let him go ahead with his presentation. Great, thanks very much for having me. I'm excited to be here and talk about some of our data. Um, so I have, I have nothing to disclose and I have no financial relationship with Visium. Um, I am a part of the Kidney Precision Medicine Project. So this is a consortium of many universities. Uh, and I know you have Jonathan Barash on here earlier. He's, he's part of the consortium. And um, there are recruitment sites that are altruistically, are collecting altruistically donated kidney biopsies. And then we have a number of uh, tissue interrogation sites who are performing um, basically omics technologies or imaging technologies on these biopsies. Um, and we try to perform as many of the technologies as we can on as little tissue as possible in order to maximize the information that we get for these individuals. So I think we have over 140 biopsies at present. Um, and some of the techniques that we use are single cell RNA-seq, single nuclear RNA-seq, spatial transcriptomics, slide-seq spatial transcriptomics, uh, uh, laser microdissection regional transcriptomics, uh, we have proteomics, both from laser microdissection, and there was a brief phase where we did some spatial proteomics as well. Uh, there's metabolomics data, both spatial metabolomics, spatial lipidomics, and end glycomics. Uh, from an imaging perspective, there's 3D tissue cytometry, so it's eight, eight channels of imaging, but you get morphological features. There's MyFish, which mi mixes RNA and protein. There's Codex, which will give you about 40 markers of protein, imaging mass cytometry, and DartFish for um, selected RNA molecules. And then epigenetics, there's DNA methylseq data, microRNA-seq data, cut and run data, and ATAC-seq data. All this is available at kpmp.org. Um, it's publicly available. There is some of the data will go through, actually all the data goes through a curation process. Um, so not all of the data is forward facing at this moment, but for example, all of the single cell RNA-seq and single nuclear RNA-seq and uh, proteomic data is now forward, forward facing. You can download the data sets or summary data if you're so interested. So the objectives of the talk today, number one, review relevant quality control metrics. So I wanna talk about how we onboarded this technique as part of the KPMP, discuss the application of existing single cell RNA-seq atlases to uh, deconvolute and enrich spatial transcriptomic data sets, and then understand strategies to determine co-localization of say infiltrating and resident immune cells in the kidney. So why spatial transcriptomics? Well, other technologies don't afford the breadth of signature with spatial resolution. Uh, bulk transcriptomics, obviously you lose cell resolution. Uh, standard immunofluorescence or in situ hybridization imaging you know, frequently is less than whole transcriptome, or if it is whole transcriptome, it is really prohibitively expensive right now. Um, and then single nuclear and single cell RNA-seq provide, provide cell type expression, and obviously there are receptor ligand and other cellular interactions that can be, can be inferred based on the expression signatures, but you otherwise lack the spatial context. So spatial transcriptomics kind of fits in there and links a lot of these things together. 
So here's an overview of some of the data that you um, may be seeing today, and I just want to kind of walk through it so you understand it. So the goal of this technology is to visualize gene expression of over 20,000 genes directly on an HNE stained co-section. Uh, the unique features are it's close to whole transcriptome with the 20,000 genes. You have the histological uh, information on the same section, not a sequential section, and it's complementary to imaging and spatial technologies. We're also very concerned about tissue economy in the KPMP. So, you know, these biopsies are small. Um, they're, you know, somebody has altruistically decided to give up a piece of their kidney for the KPMP. And so we want to use it with the greatest um, uh, uh, reverence possible. And so using as little piece of tissue as possible is, is part of that. So this is with 10 microns of thickness and a typical biopsy may be a thousand microns in terms of uh, diameter. So here, here's an image. This, we, we use the OCT sample, and I have a couple of images from FFPE coming up later in the talk. But this is an OCT stained, uh, OCT section stained with H and E. You can see a glomerulus here. You can see some tubules here. This actually will we'll, we'll show you as a, a DCT moving into a collecting duct over here. So here's an example of expression that maps on top of the visium. So here's NPHS2, uh, which is potosin mapped over the glomerulus. And then you can see SLC12A3, which is the thiazide sensitive co-transporter in the distal convoluted tubule. Okay, So this should be high or red in the DCT portion of it, and it should be decreasing in expression as you go into the collecting duct, which is what happens here. So in addition to looking at individual genes, we basically take the whole KPMP single nuclear RNA-seq atlas and map it back on top and deconvolute all these spots to ask what is the proportion of signature arising from each of these spots. Um, and so here in the glomerulus, we have spot, we have a couple of different colors here. You have the salmon color, the brown color, and the blue color. So the salmon corresponds to podocytes. The brown corresponds to degenerative or damaged podocytes. So we get a little bit of a cell state in addition to the cell type signature. Um, and the blue here is endothelial cell, glomerular capillary endothelial cells. Uh, which are all cell types that you expect to find over the glomerulus mapping. And then here in the tubule, you can see we go from these more green tones over to the blue tones. And this basically says that we're moving from uh, distal convoluted tubule and connecting tubule into more collecting duct type cells, like intercalated cell and principal cells as you move along here. Okay. Um, this is just meant to be an overview of the types of data that you're going to see during the talk, uh, not really any uh, major interpretations here. So I'm going to predominantly talk about the 10x Visium platform. Um, this is a typical slide. So it's Visium spatial gene expression slide. You have four fiducial zones on it, each of which are about six by six millimeters. Um, you have these fiducial spots on the outside, which allows you to you know, map back the transcriptomic signature on top of the image. Each of these, uh, there are spots underlying this with barcodes. And so essentially your tissue goes on top of this uh, spot. Um, you, do the, you stain it, you image it, you try to do it pretty rapidly. We do it within half an hour. Um, then we permeabilize. The permeabilization for kidney takes 12 minutes, but you want to optimize that for whatever tissue you're working with. Um, and after it's perme permeabilized, the RNA kind of binds with the beads that are underlying the tissue. Um, and then you can collect that, uh, excuse me, the RNA. You can collect that RNA and do cDNA synthesis to make your library and then sequence it. So here's an example of a nephrectomy within the fiducial zone. Um, great. So, and then the idea is that you're mapping cell types on top of the on top of the nephrectomy. And so, in this case, these are unsupervised, unbiased clusters uh, with glomeruli that are red. And the tally, you can actually make out some um, uh, uh, loops, uh, medullary rays with loops of Henle protruding into the cortex. So, the medullary portion of this particular sample is down here in the right lower corner. You can see medullary rays popping up into the cortex. So, I'm going to show you a little bit about a close up. So here you can make out glomeruli here. Here's this medullary ray that's kind of moving in a perpendicular fashion throughout the tubule, uh, throughout, the, throughout the sample. Uh, these pinkly eosinophilic bodies here are uh, proximal tubules where you can't see the lumen because they have that brushy uh, brush border. And then uh, you can make out some collecting ducts here, which are sort of larger tubules uh, with interposed nuclei. So these map appropriately to the cell types that you would expect. And this is all in the JCI paper, but it's basically for us, I don't think that the OCT histology is so strong that you can infer a ton of information from it, but it helps us ground it and it's an orthogonal data set to, to basically say the transcriptomic signature that you're getting makes sense in this environment. Um, there are some disease samples that I'll show you a little later where you're able to infer some, um, some disease type signature there. 
uh, but we're working on trying to get some uh, corresponding protein data along with the uh, transcriptomic data to um, really pull out the signatures to a greater extent. So in red here, you have the glomeruli that are highlighted, blue intended to light up for proximal tubules. This black region was the ascending loop of Henle. So kind of the competitors to Visium out there, Visium, the, the downsides is 55 micron spot size. Okay. Uh, the upside is that you have histology on the same section. There's obviously an HD version coming out maybe later this year. SlideZeek version two is not commercially available, uh, but has smaller spot sizes with about a 10 micron resolution. Um, and the histology you have to, of course, do on consecutive sections. Um, you know, SlideZeek version two is typically done on frozen liquid nitrogen samples. But um, as part of the KPMP, uh, Jamie Marshall and Anna Greca's group got it to work on OCT samples. Um, so it is technically possible to be done there. Uh, you get less genes per spot on SlideSeq, but the summative expression in terms of transcripts per area is actually the same in SlideSeq and Visium. It's not any different. Um, so if you add up all the spots that go inside a 55 micron larger Visium spot, it'll be similar. Um, and then we talked earlier on the call about GeoMX nano string. And in full disclosure, I haven't used this. Um, I just, you know, have had some discussions with the company about it um, because we had to compare for a paper um, what were the number of genes detected and how do you, uh, and what were the transcripts that you got from those uh, regions of interest. Uh, it, again, seemed to be comparable to Visium. I'd say, you know, uh, my, my gut feeling is GeoMX NanoString is going to be less expensive than Visium. It kind of depends on how many regions of interest you capture. Do you need two full 96 well plates because you're capturing nearly 200 regions of interest, then it might be more expensive than Visium, but if you can get it to fit on one plate, it might be less. As part of the Kidney Precision Medicine Project, confirming biological reproducibility was a really important aspect of onboarding this technology. Um, so one of the things that we did was look at uh, marker gene expression that correlated with the single cell transcriptomic uh, cell clusters, and we found strong concordance with what we called in spatial transcriptomics, what we would call a glomerulus or a proximal tubule or a tal, et cetera, uh, with the single cell data sets. Um, the other thing is even, even a really, I'm not a renal pathologist, but even a really well-trained renal pathologist would have a hard time on an OCT embedded specimen with H&E staining to distinguish 12 different subtypes of proximal tubule. They can probably say this is a proximal tubule, this is a tau, this is a collecting duct, but they may not be able to go into all the subtypes. And so our current KPMP atlas has over 100 cell types, but that includes a lot of sub-cell types and cell states. Um, so we didn't really go, we didn't try to validate 100 different clusters. We tried to validate the major um, observable tubules within the samples. So for example, we looked at the correlation of hist we looked at the concordance of histological alignment with what the cluster was called in spatial transcriptomics for the glomerulus, for the proximal tubule, tau, DCT, collecting duct, and the interstitium. And we had really high concordance between the um, uh, between what the histology underlying the spot was and what the identity of the spot was that mapped it. Um, the, the concordance was greater than 90% in every category. The collecting duct was the lowest performer. And if you exclude the collecting duct, we're above 97%. And part of that is because the collecting duct had the smallest number of spots to it. Um, as part of the KPMP, we had to show technical reproducibility. So we actually did the same specimen multiple times on different occasions and said, do you come up with the same data? Basically, we did. So here's an example of two replicates. Um, and you can see here, uh, these are very similar. Uh, but you can actually make out here this black structure that's coming in from the spatial transcriptomics. This is a medullary ray that's evolving uh, over the course of the biopsy. We looked at the concordance between um, the number of spots mapping for the three, the three replicates that we did, and it was very similar across the board. Uh, what we saw was a difference was actually the amount of this tau or thick ascending loop, which is part of a medullary ray. So the one, the sample that had a larger portion of medullary ray visually ended up having a larger portion of those spots mapping, but otherwise very similar across the board. Uh, these are a summary of all the other quality control metrics. And I've included the slide here so that if you, um, you know, stream this or look at it later, it's there, uh, but I won't go through it in, in detail right now uh, for the sake of time. I will highlight a couple of the ones that we use to make sure that the technique is going well. Um, so the first one is exonic mapped reads greater than 30%. So here's looking at a Levy-Jennings plot. A Levy-Jennings plot basically asks um, how, uh, 
the samples that you're running and the quality control metric that you're measuring is their drift. Has, have the samples moved in any direction? You can see these are the, the amount of standard deviations that go away from the mean. And there is certainly a batch effect in terms of the samples run, but part of that is because the samples were collected in different places. So some of the samples had higher RINs than other. Um, and we looked at the correlation between the reads that mapped confidently to exons and RIN, and we found that there was a positive correlation and a pretty, pretty remarkable one at that. Now, Visium will tell you to not use any tissue with a RIN less than seven. So if you simply limited it to a RIN of seven here, you cut off a lot of the samples that were, that were run. Now, some of these are biopsy samples or they're um, nephrectomy tissue uh, acquired from the KPMP. And we wanted to understand, you know, could we actually push the threshold lower and still get usable data? So the company itself sets a reads map confidently to Exxon threshold of 30%. Um, and we found that most of our samples reached that threshold, except for the two that ended up having a really low RIN. So anything less than a RIN of 3.8 for us uh, didn't meet, meet this threshold. There was still probably some usable data, even for that poor quality RNA, those poor quality RNA samples, uh, but it was harder to interpret. You would just get less genes measured, less transcript detected per spot. But when your RIN was above four, we still found pretty reasonable pretty usable data and we were able to map the single cells uh, clusters onto the tissue samples uh, pretty well. Um, so this comes down to it, if, if these individuals are altruistically donating a piece of their kidney, can we you know, interrogate it and use it to the greatest extent possible? It's probably not fair to say, oh, your, your particular kidney had a RIN of six and it doesn't need a RIN of seven, which is the manufacturer's suggested threshold. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna analyze it. So we still think that we can get reasonable data uh, with a little bit lower RIN. Um, another one of the measures is fraction of reads under the tissue. So it's obviously a bad sign if you're getting reads that are mapping where there's no tissue, where it's just empty space. And so uh, the manufacturer sets a threshold of 50%. And in all cases, even with lower RIN values, we were able to exceed that 50% threshold. So this is a less sensitive quality control metric. Um, so earlier today, it was asked, what kind, of, um, what kind of gene expression are you getting? What kind of transcript expression are you getting from these samples? And I pulled up a couple here uh, just to give you an idea. And there's not a huge difference even when the RINs are different. So one, one sample had a RIN of 8.9, one had a RIN of 5.4. We're not finding a huge correlation between RIN and, as long as you're over sort of that RIN of four threshold. We're not finding a huge correlation between a number of reads per spot or number of genes uh, expressed. Uh, but you know we're, we're getting about 2,000-ish to 3,000-ish genes per spot. We're getting about 70 to 100,000 reads per spot. Um, and overall, per, on a per sample basis, we get pretty reliably around 20,000-ish genes. Uh, we do think that going forward, um, batch, batch correction and normalization will be important. Um, we don't know that you have to do both. So we recently um, looked at batch correction for three different batches. And here's sort of the uncorrected GAP-DH, and here's the uncorrected active beta. And you can see that there are large differences here. Um, after normalization, so this is done with an SCT transform function, very similar to what you would use for single cell sequencing, except we're doing it for spots instead of cells. Um, we get much more reliable expression of GAP-DH and active beta. Again, it's not perfect, but uh, it's pretty good but adding a batch correction variable to that transformation didn't seem to have a whole lot of added benefit over and above that. Um, so suggesting that you, know, you may just be able to do SCT transform and uh, be able to compare specimens across them. All right, so we have looked at FFPE as well. Um, this is one of our KPMP pilot samples. Um, the advantage of FAPE, of course, is the uh, morphology. You just get such a beautiful morphology uh, with paraffin embedded specimens as compared to the OCT. The thing is, you still have to balance how much tissue you're using. So a typical pathologist for an Asian e stain might do a three micron cut, and we're still doing a 10 micron cut here uh, in order to get enough RNA. Technically, Visium says you can go down to five microns. Uh, we haven't tried it yet. And even with this um, 10 micron cut, we're finding that the overall uh, total number of genes, uh, excuse me, the total number of genes expressed is actually higher, but the total number of reads is actually lower in the FFPE tissue uh, than, the, than the OCT embedded sample. The other thing that we've noticed is the specificity of the signature is a little bit lower in the FFPE than the OCT. 
So what that means is, so we have these structures in the kidney called glomeruli, and we expect to see gene expression localized for glomerular markers solely over the glomerular. And so here you're seeing MPHS2, which is potosin, which is a, a marker of the glomeruli spread throughout the tissue on the left, okay, on the left here. But uh, what, what you'll see at the bottom portion of this particular sample is that when the glomeruli are nearby each other, that there's this halo effect or bleed effect where the MPH expression, MPHS2 expression is actually picked up in the surrounding area of the tissue, which isn't actually in the glomerulus. And so we're just, we've just found that the FFPE version of this isn't quite as clean as the um, OCT embedded sample in terms of transcriptomic signature. All right, so moving on from quality control metrics into um, deconvolution tactics. Something happened. Okay, great. So as part of the KPMP, we set up a molecular atlas. Um, it's got 200,000 nuclei, 100,000 cells. It's all publicly available on www.kpmp.org. Uh, there's a paper that's in bioarchive right now that's under review. Uh, Blue Lake is the first author, but it's a niches of injury paper. Uh, so you can look for it if you'd like to. Um, but in addition to having these 300,000 nuclei and cells that are part of the atlas defining 100 different cell types, we actually found cell states that were different as well. Um, so we found a, a variety of altered cell states. We're calling the reference sort of the healthy kidney cell state. The adaptive epithelial would be inclusive of both maladaptive and adaptive. So a cell that's undergone injury and trying to undergo repair, sometimes it does it well, sometimes it doesn't. The adaptive stromal femoral type would be sort of a, um, a stromal cell like a fibroblast that is actively laying matrix. Uh, we found cycling cells, transitioning cells, and then degenerative cells. And the kind of the phenotype for degenerative would be the, um, the epithelial cell that's lost a lot of its, what, what makes it that specific epithelial cell. Uh, so maybe it's undergoing epithelial to mesenchymal transition or losing its identity. Anyway, we looked at a variety of deconvolution tactics to try to understand how to map this signature onto the spots. And on the left here, you see a histology for a nephrectomy. And we've highlighted the glomeruli with these uh, black circles here. And then you can see MPHS2 pretty reliably maps to those glomeruli, actually very reliably maps to those glomeruli. Uh, and then our, the first of our deconvolution methods here is Surratt. And I'm going to give you a close up here of it. Okay. And inside the glomeruli, what you'll see are mostly red, blue, and pink, and purple. And this corresponds to podocyte signature mesangial cell signature, endothelial capillary signature, um, basically cell types that you expect to be there inside, uh, inside the glomerulus. We thought that was a win. Two other methodologies that are out there right now, which are very popular, are Spotlight and RCTD. And I'm going to show you what happens with those. So with Spotlight, we don't find, we find podocyte signature, but a much more reduced and muted version of podocyte signature as compared to the Surratt transfer score methodology that we use there. Um, instead, what we find is a lot of macrophage signature and a lot of endothelial si signatures. So what Spotlight tends to do is it emphasizes cells, cell types that are broadly distributed across the whole tissue. So the underlying logic on it will pull out things that are found everywhere rather than things that are localized under that specific spot and overemphasize those. In contrast, RCTD has a completely different underlying philosophy, and um, it's better used, I think, for slide seek, where you have at most two, maybe three cell types that you're trying to deconvolute rather than 100 or rather than 25 cells that are underlying a spot. And the reason for this is it's looking for the thing that's most different. Okay, and in this case, you see a ton of yellow here that isn't picked up on other on other um, on the other methodologies, and it's intercalated cell signature. So apparently RCTD feels like intercalated, intercalated cells are the most different of them, and it tends to overemphasize the cell type uh, in the deconvolution. So again, we found that Surratt-based deconvolution is probably the most appropriate, at least for the kidney. And if you're using other, other tissues, I encourage you to look at it. Now, the caveat here is, should the transcriptomic signature correspond with the underlying histology? You could make an argument maybe that uh, one cell type should have more expression than another, and you shouldn't be seeing that. So, I, I mean, this is this is taking the, making the assumption that what you see on the histology, you should be detecting on the transcriptomics. Uh, and if you don't believe with that, if you don't believe that assumption, you know, you can make credible arguments not to. Uh, maybe one of these other deconvolution tactics would still be better for you. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about applications here. 
All right, and first we'll talk about cell type localization. So this was um, perhaps our first paper that we looked at um, spatial transcriptomics in the kidney from eLife in 2020 it was done by one of our junior faculty, Danielle Janicevic and Pierre Dager. And what Danielle, what Dr. Janicevic did is she made a time course of sepsis, uh, basically going from time zero, zero to one hour after to 16 hours after to 36 hours after. And she identified this set of cells that were undergoing a, a strong amount of proliferation. And at the time they were thinking, oh, well, this could be some sort of novel set of cells that are widely distributed throughout the kidney and they're all clustering on the single cell because they're proliferating. Well, that ended up not being the case. Um, so it ended up that the proliferating cells were mapping to the outer stripe. So these were essentially S3 type two cells that were mapping to the outer stripe. And that's where the proliferation was occurring uh, in this model of sepsis. Um, and so I think in this situation, the spatial transcriptomics really allowed us to interpret that hey, this isn't something special. This is you know, just the biology and we're finding where this proliferation is occurring uh, rather than identifying a novel cell type. All right, uh, there's one, um, there's a comment here. Do you get transcription factors, i.e. genes not highly expressed in addition to other known genes? Um, so this is from Dr. Mendelssohn. So the answer to that is we do get transcription factors expressed, but at relatively lower levels than some of the epithelial cell markers. And um, take with that what you will. Um, I, I don't know that I trust the specificity of, of that. I, I would trust the specificity that if we detect it, it's there, but I wouldn't necessarily trust the sensitivity that if we don't detect it, it's not there. Um, and yeah. all right, moving on. So immune cell co-localization driving single uh, cell RNA-seq subclustering. So this is an example from our JCI Insight paper. So in this paper, what we did is we looked at three models of acute kidney injury, um, actually two models. We looked at sham, ischemia reperfusion, and sequel ligation puncture. And then we used a common single cell RNA-seq atlas to map each model. So we merged cell types from similar mice, mouse kidneys uh, into one single atlas and mapped it. Um, at the time, that was a decision point. You had to decide that. Nowadays, that's common practice. But um, you know, at the time, we were wondering, well, should we be mapping the single cell signature specific to IRI onto the IRI and the one specific to CLP onto CLP? Uh, but it turns out that the more cells you have, the more cell types you get and the more specific sub-cell types you get, and it's easier to map. Um, so that's the right answer. Um, here's the actual mapping of, of these uh, uh, variety of murine cell types onto the kidneys. But what you'll find is that we found a lot of epithelial cells overlying these kidneys, tons of epithelial cells, but very little of the stromal cells and the, um, and the immune cells that would infiltrate here because of just predominance. There, you see a lot more of the epithelial cells than you do the immune cells. So we wanted to understand the immune cell distribution within these kidneys. So here you can see sham and here you can see IRI. So our approach here was to actually suppress all the epithelial cells and not display them and look and see where the immune cell signature then lie. Um, we included fibroblasts in this analysis because we were interested in stromal cells. And we also said, well, if the immune cell's there, it should be at least as, the signature of that immune cell should be at least as dominant as a, as a fibroblast. So it's a little bit like a negative control. What we found in the IRI model is what you'd expect. We found a number of neutrophils here, these sort of dark gray green infiltrating into the outer stripe here. Uh, so that's not novel. Other people have shown that before. Uh, we did find that that transcriptomically, the cells that were called S3 outer stripe, proximal tubule S3 outer stripe, were ones that co-localized with that neutrophil signature. Let's see if it works. Okay, and we confirmed that the, by uh, immunostaining with codex that those neutrophils infiltrated in that outer stripe as well. Again, none of this is novel. That's all expected. But here's what we did with that information next. So here we took these spots that co-localized with neutrophils versus the ones that didn't co-localize with neutrophils of the S3. And um, we found a number of genes that were differentially expressed. And among them was this ATF3. There's actually been someone who's published a knockout model on ATF3 and it's a chemotactic factor for neutrophils. Uh, so that played into, that was an advantage for us that, that we had that information available. But the ATF3 localized very closely to where the neutrophils localized in that outer stripe of the ischemia reperfusion, both in terms of gene expression here in F and also in terms of protein expression here in G. And then we found that the amount of ATF3 was higher when it co in, in uh, PTS3 that co-localized with neutrophils, okay? 
versus PTS3 that co-localized with any other immune cell, any other immune cell that was dominant. And then the, PT, the ATF3 expression was higher in the PT uh, outer stripe as compared to all other epithelial cells as well. So we wanted to dig down deeper into that and figure out what's going on. So um, we took the S3 outer stripe and we included the S3 cortical cells as well um, and reclustered them at a higher resolution. And we found about 13 different, um, uh, 13 different subclusters. And one of those subclusters was highly upregulated for ATF3. And we can map this subcluster back to the single nuclear map. So here's an example of where we use the spatial transcriptomics to define a subcluster in the single nuclear and single cell RNA-seq data set that maybe we would have overlooked otherwise uh, because we didn't we we you know didn't look at the single nuclear data set with that level of resolution to say this is the one cell that you know there's a small amount of it here in the single nuclear data set but there's actually a really high proportion of it here in the spatial transcriptomics disproportionately large. All right. So I'll pause now. Um, we're doing okay on time. I'll pause now for questions. There's one in the chat from Dr. Raj. The method showing the intercalated cells, they seem too abundant. Only one third of the collecting document. Yeah, I completely agree that intercalated cells are overemphasized in RCTD. And I would not recommend using RCTD for visium in uh, spatial, for uh, uh, kidney samples at all. Completely agree with that assessment. I, I think, you know, after trying all the different deconvolution methods, the Surratt anchoring method is probably the best for kidney, in my opinion. Um, and I've seen some publications out there on BioArchive that are using RCTD, and, and I've looked at them, and in the supplements, you'll find that they have overemphasis of the intercalated cells in those publications as well. So I, I think RCT is better suited for SlideSeq than Visium, just my opinion. Any other questions before we move forward? Okay, then I'm gonna transition into in injury signature mapping. So this is described in the current bioarchive paper, uh, that's uh, Blue Lake's bioarchive paper, but I wanna show you how we get to the injury signatures. Okay. So this is a combined process from the KPMP and the HubMap. Uh, there are a lot of technologies that went into this paper, uh, single nuclear RNA-seq, single cell, snare-seq, 3D imaging, slide-seq, and Visium. Um, so a lot of data went into this paper. Essentially what we did is we took human kidney biopsies from the KPMP as well uh, that were AKI or CKD, as well as reference samples that were both from the HubMap and the KPMP. We did tissue processing to disaggregate cells, and we did single cell. We did uh, tissue processing to disaggregate nuclei, and that went for both uh, single nuclear RNA-seq and then also snare-seq, which gives you essentially ATAC-seq with the gene expression. Uh, and then we also took sections, and those sections were used for spatial transcriptomics and 3D tissue cytometry, other spatial technologies. Here's uh, the atlas, okay? So it's 300,000 cells there, uh, 200,000 nuclei, and 100,000 cells make up this atlas. So within this atlas, I think I described this earlier, but we have a variety of cell states that we're looking at um, to try and summarize injury. We could have called these cell states, cell state one, two, three, four, five, six. We name them. Uh, I know there's a lot of connotation that comes with a name. Um, and some people don't like having names. They just prefer to them to be more agnostic, but here's what the names mean to us, okay? Um, so as we talk about it, we're, we're going to have an adaptive cell state, which both summarizes adaptive repair and maladaptive repair to tubular injury. And of course, maladaptive repair may ultimately pr pr uh, proceed to fibrosis. And we're not trying to, we're not at a level right now with our own atlas where we can predict that. Um, some of the folks who like Blue Lake and Raji Menon, um, as part of the KPMP are trying to use trajectory mapping to determine which of the cells that are under, that are quote, ad have adaptive signatures will ultimately recover and which ones will ultimately go on to fibrosis. But, you know, we have a single snapshot in time and sometimes it's difficult to predict that based on the transcriptomic signature. Anyway, so adaptive is one of the forms of injury that we're looking at. Degeneration, uh, we tend to find markers of necrosis and apoptosis. And again, they lose a lot of the things that make it that things that make it a specific type of epithelial cells. So you lose a lot of the, the canonical markers. Uh, we have cell types of repair and cycling and transitioning. 
And we do detect those in the biopsies, but they're at such a small amount that we may not focus on it. Uh, right now, we just don't have enough spots or cells that are undergoing those processes to make broad sweeping conclusions about them. So really what you're gonna find are a lot of comparisons between the reference cell state or healthy cell state to this adaptive cell state, and then to the degenerative cell state, which is nearing uh, necrosis and apoptosis. Okay, so with respect to Visium, uh, we, with this new updated atlas, uh, we confirmed that the cell types that the, the, um, the spot, main spot definition of a spot expressed the appropriate canonical markers. Um, so for example, podocytes express uh, podocin and podocalixin. Uh, but degenerative podocytes express those to a lesser extent. Uh, we did cell type mapping for all of our samples. So it was a 23 samples per Visium that we used. Uh, and so you can see each of these are deconvoluted. And then we histologically validated all those clusters. Okay, so we looked at the correlation of the expression of these cell types to sort of a level one class or a summary class of things that would be expressed in the glomerulus, cell types that would be found in the glomerulus, uh, all the different varieties of proximal tubules, all the different varieties of tau, and we looked at uh, did they correlate well with the histologically validated clusters, and they do. Okay, um, so it's a lot of work. We don't. We at this point we're not going through on each and every spot and asking um, what is the underlying histology for that each and every spot and scoring it with pathologists. That takes a really long time, but we've done that for enough spots at this point that we can look at the correlation between histologically validated clusters and what we're seeing in these samples that are mapping. Okay, here's an example of a diabetic biopsy. So there are sort of three sections of tissue here. The, the top one is actually the medulla, and then the bottom two are cortex in this particular situation. And I'm going to focus your attention on this little loop that you're seeing right here and this little area of interstitial fibrosis that you're seeing here. Okay, so basically we deconvoluted the signatures from each of these sections um, with the 100 cell types. So this loop here, uh, what you'll see is an area of histology where you see tubules. Uh, some of the tubules have epithelial simplification. Again, I don't want to overread because it's a you know, OCT frozen embedded specimen, but what's really remarkable about these is you can see casts inside all of them. So there's pretty clear cellular casts, ATN, that's going on inside a lot of these tubules here, and it tends to take place in this arc here as you're seeing it. We found very specific signature in this arc. Um, so this arc tends to map with, because it's medulla, it maps with collecting duct and tau markers, uh, but we actually get more of a degenerative or injured tau signature. So we get degenerative medullary principal cell signature in this arc than say normal uh, medullary principal cell. We also get some transitioning cells. So these may be cells that are, again, sort of kind of going or undergoing repair or multiplying or, or reproducing at this point uh, or undergoing cell cycle. Uh, and then the DEFB1, I've just marked here as one of the injury markers uh, from the single cell data set that uh, describes the degenerative cell type. So we thought it was interesting that the uh, degenerative cell type pretty, pretty consistently mapped over the casts. In this other area down here uh, is a region of fibrosis. Uh, I don't think it, it, you know, this fibrosis is pretty evident. Uh, and next to it is an area of proximal tubules that are uh, wide, dilated, a lot of epithelial simplification, a lot of extra ma matrix in between these proximal tubules. These are highly damaged near death proximal tubules. Um, and the predominant cell types that mapped these regions were uh, this adaptive fibroblast, so very activated fibroblasts that are laying nitrix, and then an adaptive proximal tubule, which again could un be undergoing maladaptive changes at this point. So here's that area of fibrosis that you can see here, and here are these tubules that you can see are wide and dilated, and not nearly normal. Um, within here, we saw immune cells that would congregate. So these are feature plots of immune cells. We found mast cells, neutrophils, uh, monocyte derived cells all infiltrating this area of fibrosis uh, with, with the fibroblast signature. Uh, we found markers of, um, you know, sort of undergoing epithelial mesenchymal transition or fibrosis, bimentin is upregulated, B, uh, beta 2 microglobulin is upregulated, and CDH6 is upregulated in these regions as well. So we looked globally over the 23 samples. This included six quote, reference nephrectomies, six acute kidney injury samples with ATN, and 11 chronic kidney disease samples. And we looked at the proportion of signature from you know, adaptive cell states and degenerative cell states. And we found that these adaptive and degenerative cell states are more common in the disease samples than the reference nephrectomies. 
So here you can see the reference signature. This purple bar here is the nephrectomies. They're not huge differences, but 65% of the signature is coming from reference cell states in nephrectomies, whereas only 60% in CPD and only 50% in AKI. And you know whether that's a meaningful clinical difference, we have to determine that through the KPMP, but at least we're finding these differences right now. Um, the degenerative cell state tends to be upregulated both in CKD and AKI. The adaptive epithelial cell state tends to be upregulated both in CKD and AKI. And then this adaptive stromal, which is the fibrosis signature, tends to be upregulated most in CKD uh, proportionally. Um, here's an example of mapping just the pure cell states on these samples. So on the left is a uh, reference nephrectomy. You've actually seen this piece of tissue before. You can see that there's some adaptive epithelial signature in here, uh, but then you can see the fibrotic diabetic kidney disease biopsy. There's you know, a great deal more of this adaptive epithelial signature. So we now wanted to understand um, you know, do these, are these cell states meaningful? Do they convey more of uh, just beyond injury? Are there uh, immune cells that infiltrate here? Are there uh, stromal cells that uh, infiltrate here? Um, so what we did here is a new type of clustering, okay? So we did clusters that are based on co-localized Surratt transfer scores. So not based on the gene expression uh, signature itself. Um, so if you think about it, all those little spots had a pie graph, okay? And each of those pie graph corresponded to a cell type. And we took whatever the size of that wedge was, and that became the, 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 the um, quantitative metric that we clustered by. And we first selected cells that were mainly tau, because we, for example, for this analysis, we're very interested in tau. Okay? So tau had to be the most abundant epithelial cell type as a denominator. right? And then we pull all those in, and we recluster them. And we got 13, we're going to call them neighborhoods. Um, so the neighborhood here is just a new cluster, but a cluster not based solely on gene expression, but based on the proportion of signature that's arising from the cell types that are underlying each spot. And we said, what is co-localizing? What's nearby? Um, and so these are, you know, our 13 neighborhoods that we got here. And a couple that I'll show you, neighborhood five here has a lot of purple. And so this, this neighborhood here tended to be a co-localized stromal neighborhood, where we got a lot of fibroblast and myofibroblast signature that co-localized with the tau. Neighborhood seven had a lot of lymphoid signature and neighborhood 11 had a lot of myeloid signature. So these are these neighborhoods, you can see them here. So here's uh, neighborhood five, you can see stromal upregulated here, fibroblast, myo uh, medullary fibroblast signature upregulated here. Uh, cluster seven had B cell, plasma cell, T cell, mast cell signature upregulated. Cluster 11 here had MAC M2, MDCs, and uh, monocytes that were upregulated, again, in this myeloid cluster. There were also injury clusters that had no immune cells and no stromal. So for example, this cluster three ended up having the adaptive tau signature was highly upregulated, but didn't really have any immune cells, didn't really have any stromal cells. Um, and then you know there were normal clusters like cortical tau and medullary tau as well. Some of the clusters were not very exciting because they simply represented co-localization with you know, other epithelial cells. So maybe there's a whole group of neighborhood where we, you know, the tau was next to a proximal tubule and got half the spot on one type of, and half the spot on the other. And we didn't really focus on those because we weren't excited or interested about that. It seemed, that seemed less uh, biologic and just more by random chance. So we looked at the spots that, co that were defined here and we, we asked, do immune cells co-localize with these cell states? And so, again, we have this reference or healthy cell state, we have the degenerative, we have the adaptive cell state. And when you look at the odds ratio of co-localization, uh, it goes up significantly with these adaptive, with these you know, altered cell states. So for example, neutrophil infiltration goes up with this adaptive cell state. Um, both, uh, uh, so monocyte, this is non-classical monocyte and this is monocyte derived cells. Both of those go up in the setting of uh, adaptive and degenerative cell states. Fibroblast co-localization is higher when you have an altered cell state with that cell type. So I think that makes sense. But you know, this is a way to say, okay, you know, if if you're looking at your spatial transcriptomics and you're going to do 100 samples, how do you summarize all of that data from those 100 samples discreetly and quantitatively? And so our approach here is to do it with neighborhoods rather than say, okay, well, this is an area of fibrosis and here's an example of fibrosis and where you know, these injury cell types are mapping uh, to do it sort of globally over the course of all the biopsies and give people a score of their adaptive and degenerative signature that map over their biopsies. 
And who knows, maybe at some point that'll correlate with outcomes. And here's all epithelial cells, and we found very similar patterns with all epithelial cells as compared to tau. So with regard to out outcomes, um, there is uh, some correlation with outcomes. This is two different data sets. One is from Neptune, and one is from the uh, European cDNA Biobank. And we looked at the, the proportion of adaptive and degenerative score within single cell RNA sequencing, okay, or within bulk RNA sequencing of an aggregated signature of it. We looked at that and correlated it with survival. Um, so here, what you have is the APT state score, uh, and you would get a score based on your uh, either RNA sequencing or single nuclear RNA sequencing. Um, and individuals who had low adaptive proximal tubule state score had less, had better survival than individuals who had high adaptive uh, PT score. Likewise, tau, same situation. Degenerative wasn't quite statistically significant, but trended in that direction. Um, and then we looked at individuals across different disease types and asked the same questions. And so LD here is the living donor. That's kind of the comparison in this group. And we found that your um, uh, adaptive proximal tubular state score, you know, at least from the single cell data sets, was increased in diabetes, was increased in FSGS and some of the other disease states as compared to living donors. Uh, likewise, tau was upregulated in a couple of these cell states compared to, or a couple of these disease states compared to living donors.